Section 16 of Astounding Stories 16, May 1931. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings. Chapter 8 What Has Gone Before? Let me out of here, came the cry. What's that, Larry? Listen, I said to my companion. We stopped in the street. We had heard a girl's scream, then her frantic muffled words to attract our attention. Then we saw her white face at the basement window. It was on the night of June eighth to ninth, 1950, when I was walking with my friend Larry Gregory through Patton Place in New York City. My name is George Rankin. In a small deserted house we found the strange girl, brought her out, took her away in a taxi to an alienist for examination. We thought she might be demented. This strangely beautiful girl, in a long white satin dress with a powdered white wig and a black beauty patch on her cheek, for she told us that the deserted house had just a few minutes before been her house, and though we assured her this was the summer of 1935, she told us her name was Mistress Mary Atwood, that her father was Major Atwood of General Washington's staff, and that she had just now come from the year 1777. We took her to my friend Dr. Elton, and she told her strange story. A cage, like a room of shining metal bars, had materialized in her garden. A great mechanical monster, a thing of metal ten feet tall and fashioned in the guise of a man, had captured her. She was whirled away into the future, in the cage. Then she was released, the cage had vanished, and Larry and I had passed by the house and rescued her. Captured by a robot in a time-traveling cage, we tried to fathom it. And why had she been captured? Had she some enemy? She could only think of a fellow called Tug. He was a hideously repulsive cripple who had dared make love to her and had threatened vengeance against her and her father. Tug! exclaimed Elton. A cripple? Why, he lived in New York City three years ago, in 1932. A coincidence? The Tug whom Mary knew in 1777 seemed the same person who in 1932 had gotten into trouble with the New York police and had vowed some weird vengeance against them and all the city. And equally strange, this house on Patton Place, where we had found the girl, was owned by the same Tug, who now was wanted for the murder of a girl and could not be found. With Dr. Elton and Mary Atwood, Larry and I returned that same night to the house on Patton Place. Near dawn, in the back yard of the house, the time-traveling cage appeared again. The robot came from it. Alton, Larry, and I attacked the monster and were defeated. When the fight was over, Larry and Alton lay senseless. The mechanical thing seized Mary and me, shoved us in the cage, and whirled us away into time. Larry presently recovered. He rushed into Patton Place, and in his path another, much smaller cage appeared. A man and a girl leaped from it, and when Larry fought with them, they carried him off in their vehicle. He learned they were chasing the larger cage. They were not hostile to Larry and presently made friends with him. They were Princess Tina and a young scientist named Harl, both of the world of 2930. The two cages had come from 2930. The larger one had been stolen by an insubordinate robot named Migul, a pseudo-human mechanism running amok. Again, Tug, the cripple, was mentioned. In 2930 he was a prominent scientist, but Harl and Tina mistrusted him. Tug and Harl had invented the time-traveling cages. It was a strange time-world, that 2930, which now was described to Larry. It was an era in which all work was done by mechanisms, fantastic robots, all but human, and they were now upon the verge of revolt against their human masters. Miguel was one of them. It had stolen one of the cages, gone to 1777, and abducted Mary Atwood, and now, with her and me in its power, was headed back for 1777 upon some strange mission. Was it acting for the cripple, Tug? It seemed so. Tina and Harl, with Larry, chased our cage, and stopped in a night of the summer of 1777. Simultaneously, from the house on Patton Place, in June of 1935, robots began 
appearing. A hundred of them, or a thousand, no one knew. With swords and flashing red and violet light beams they spread over the city in the never-to-be-forgotten massacre of New York. It was the beginning of the vengeance Tug had threatened. Nothing could stop the monstrous mechanical men. For three days and nights New York City was in chaos. The red beams were frigid. They brought a midsummer snowstorm. Then the violet beams turned the weather suddenly hot. A crazy wild storm swept the wrecked city. Torrential hot rain poured down. Then one dawn the beams vanished. The robots retreated into the house on Patton Place and disappeared, and New York was left a horror of death and desolation. The vengeance of Tug against the New York City of 1935 was complete. CHAPTER Eight: THE MURDER OF MAJOR ATWOOD "'We are late,' Tina whispered. It was that night in 1777 when she, Larry, and Harl stepped from their time-traveling cage, and again I am picturing the events as Larry afterward described them to me. "'Megul, in the other cage, was here,' Tina added. "'But it's gone now. Exactly where was it, I wonder?' Mary Atwood said it appeared in the garden. They crept down the length of the field, just inside the picket fence. In a moment the trees and an intervening hillock of ground hid the dimly shining outline of their own cage from their sight. The dirt road leading to Major Atwood's home was on the other side of the fence. "'Wait,' murmured Tina. "'There is a light in the house. Someone is awake.' "'When was Miguel here, do you think?' Larry whispered. Last night, perhaps, or tonight. It may be only an hour, or a few minutes ago." The faint thud of horses' hoofs on the roadway made Tina and Larry drop to the ground. They crouched in the shadows of a tree. Galloping horses were approaching along the road. The moon went under a cloud. From around a bend in the road a group of horsemen came. They were galloping. Then they slowed to a trot. A walk. They reined up in the road not more than twenty feet from Larry and Tina. In the starlight they showed clearly, men in the red and white uniform of the army of the King. Some of them wore short dark cloaks. They dismounted with a clanking of swords and spurs. Their voices were audible. "'Leave the steeds with Jake. Egad, we've made enough noise already. Here, Jake, you scoundrel. Stay safely here with the mounts. Come on, Tony. You and I will circle. We have him this time. By the King's garter, what a fool he is to come into New York at such a time. He wants to see his daughter, I venture. Right, Tony. And have you seen her? As saucy a little minx as there is in the colonies. I was quartered here last month. I do not blame the Major for wanting to come. Here, take my bridle, Jake. Tie them to the fence. There was a swift confusion of voices. Laughter. If you should hear a pistol shot, Jake, ride quickly back and tell my lord there was a fracas and you did not dare remain. I only hope he is garbed in the rebel white and blue, eh, Tony? Then he will yield like an officer and a gentleman, which he is, rebel or no. They were moving away to surround the house. Two were left. Come on, Tony. We will pound the front knocker in the name of the king. A feather in our cap when we ride him down to the bowling green and present him to my lord." The voices faded. Larry gripped the girl beside him. "'They are British soldiers going to capture Major Atwood. What can we—' He never finished. A scream echoed over the somnolent night, a voice from the rear of the house, a man's voice. The red-coated soldiers ran forward. In the field, close against the fence, Tina and Larry were running. From the garden of the house a man was screaming. Then there were other voices. Servants were awakening in the upper rooms. The screaming, shouting man rushed through the house. He appeared at the front door, standing between the high, white colonial pillars which supported the overhead porch. A yellow light fell upon him through the opened doorway. An old, white-headed negro appeared. Larry and Tina, in the nearby field, stood stricken by the scene. "'The master! The master!' he shouted this wildly. The British officers ran at him. "'You, Thomas, tell us where the Major is. We've come for him. We know he's here. Don't lie.' "'But the master!' he choked over it. "'A trick, Tony. He gad if he is trying to trick us.' They leaped to the porch and seized the old negro. 
"'Speak, you devil!' they shook him. "'The house is surrounded. He cannot escape. "'But the master is—is is dead. "'My girl Tolly saw it, and then she swooned,' he steadied himself. "'He, the major's in the garden, Master Tony, lying there dead, "'murdered by a ghost,' Tolly says, "'a great white shining ghost that came to the garden and murdered him.' If you were to delve very closely into certain old records of revolutionary New York City during the year 1777, you doubtless would find mention of the strange murder of Major Atwood, who, coming from New Jersey, is thought to have crossed the river well to the north of the city, mounted his horse, which by prearrangement one of his retainers had left for him somewhere to the south of Dykeman's farm, and ridden to his home. He came not as a spy, but in full uniform and no sooner had he reached his home when he was strangely murdered. There was only a negro tale of an apparition which had appeared in the garden and murdered the master. Larry and I have found cursory mention of that, but I doubt if the group of my lord Howe's gay young blades, who were sent north to capture Major Atwood, ever reported exactly what happened to them. The old Dutch ferryman divulged that he had been hired to ferry the homecoming major. This, too, is recorded but Tony Green and his fellow officers, sent to apprehend the colonial major, found him inexplicably murdered, and by dawn they were back at the Bowling Green, white-faced and shaken. They told some of what had happened to them, but not all. They could not expect to be believed, for instance, if they said that, though they were unafraid of a negro's tale of a ghost, they had themselves encountered two ghosts, and had fled the premises. Those two ghosts were only Larry and Tina. The negro babbled of a shining cage appearing in the garden. That, of course, was undoubtedly set down as nonsense. Tony Green and his friends went to the garden and examined the body of Major Atwood. What had killed him no one could say. No bullet had struck him. There were no wounds, no knife thrust, no sword slash. Tony held the lantern with its swaying yellow glow close to the murdered man's body. The August night was warm. The garden, banked by trees and shrubbery, was breathless and oppressively hot. Yet the body of Atwood seemed frozen. He had been dead but a short while, and already the body was stiff. More than that, it was ice cold. The face, the brows were wet as though frost had been there and now was melted. Tony Green's hand shook as he held the lantern. He tried to tell his comrades that Atwood had died from failure of the heart. Undoubtedly it was that. He had seen what he supposed was an apparition. Something had frightened him, and a weak heart had brought his death. Then, in another part of the garden, one of the searching officers found a sheet of parchment scroll with writing on it. Yet it was not parchment, either. Some strange, white, smooth fabric, which crumpled and tore very easily, the like of which this young British officer of Howe's staff had never seen before. It was found lying in a flower-bed forty or fifty feet from Atwood's body. They gathered in a group to examine it by the light of the lantern. Writing, the delicate script of Mary Atwood, a missive addressed to her father. It was strangely written, evidently not with a quill. Tony read it with an odd, frightened voice. Father, beware of Tug. Beware of Tug. And, my dear father, good-bye. I am departing, I think, to the year of our Lord, 2930. Cannot explain. A captive. Good-bye. Nothing you can do. Mary. Strange. I can imagine how strange they thought it was. Tug. Why, he was the cripple who had lived down by the Bowling Green, and had lately vanished. They were reading this singularly unexplainable missive when, as though to climax their own fears of the supernatural, they saw themselves a ghost, and not only one ghost, but two. Plain as a pike-staff, peering from a nearby tree, in a shaft of moonlight, a ghost was standing. It was the figure of a young girl, with jacket and breeches of black and gleaming white, an apparition fantastic, and a young man was with her, in a long dark jacket and dark tubular pipes for legs. The two ghosts, with dead white faces, stood peering. Then the man moved forward. His dead strange voice called. "'Drop that paper!' My Lord Howe's red-coated officers dropped the parchment and fled. And later, when Atwood's body was taken away to be given burial 
as befitted an enemy officer and a gentleman, that missive from Mary Atwood had disappeared. It was never found. Tony Green and his fellows said nothing of this latter incident. One cannot with grace explain being routed by a ghost, not an officer of His Majesty's army. Unrecorded History A Supernatural Incident of the Year 1777 Undoubtedly, in the past ages, there have been many such affairs, some never recorded, others interwoven with written history and called supernatural. Yet why must they be that? There was nothing supernatural in the events of that night in Major Atwood's garden. Is this perchance an explanation of why the pages of history are so thronged with tales of ghosts? There must indeed be many future ages down the corridors of time, where the genius of man will invent devices to fling him back into his past, and the impressions upon the past which he makes are called supernatural. Whether this be so or not, it was so in the case of these two time-traveling vehicles from 2930. Larry and I think that the world of 1935 is just now shaking off the shackles of superstition, and coming to realize that what is called the supernatural is only the unknown. Who can say, up to 1935, how many time-traveling humans have come briefly back? Is this, perchance, what we call the phenomena of the supernatural? Larry and Tina, anything but ghosts, very much alive and very much perturbed, were standing back of that tree. They saw the British officers reading the scrap of paper. They could hear only the words, Mary, and from Mistress Atwood. "'A message,' Larry whispered. She and George must have found a chance to write it, and dropped it here while the robot murdered Major Atwood. Larry and Tina vehemently wanted to read the note. Tina whispered, If we show ourselves, they will be frightened and run. It is nearly always so where Harl and I have become visible in earlier times. Yes, I'll try it. Larry stepped from the tree and shouted, Drop that paper! and a moment later, with Mary's torn little note scribbled on a scrap of paper thrust in his pocket, Larry ran with Tina from the Atwood garden. Unseen, they scurried back through the field. Under a distant tree they stopped and read the note. Twenty-nine thirty, Larry exclaimed. The robot is taking them back to your world, Tina. Then we will go there. Let us get back to Harl now. But when they reached the place where they had left the cage, it was not there. The corner of the field behind the clump of shadowing trees was empty. "'Harl! Harl!' Larry called impulsively, and then he laughed grimly. What nonsense to try and call into the past or the future to their vanished vehicle. "'Why, why, Tina!' he said in final realization. They stared at each other, pale as ghosts in the moonlight. "'Tina, he's gone, and we are left here.' They were marooned in the year 1777. End of chapter 8 Section 17 of Astounding Stories 16 May 1931 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings Chapter 9 Megul Mechanism Almost Human Mary Atwood and I lay on the metal grid floor of the largest time-cage. The giant mechanism which had captured us sat at the instrument table. Outside the bars of the cage was a dim vista of shadowy movement. The cage room was humming and glowing like a wraith. Things seemed imponderable, unsubstantial. But as my head steadied from the shock of the vehicle's start into time, my viewpoint shifted. This barred room, the metal figure of the robot, Mary Atwood, myself. We were the substance. We were real, solid. I touched Mary, and her arm, which had seemed as intangible as a ghost, now looked and felt solid. The effects of the dull red chilling ray were also wearing off. I was unharmed. I raised myself on one elbow. "'You're all right, Mary?' I asked. "'Yes.' The robot seemed not to be noticing us. I murmured, "He." It, that thing sitting there, is that the one which captured you and brought you to 1935? Yes. Quiet. It will hear us. It did hear us. It turned its head. 
In the pale light of the cage interior I had a closer view now of its face. It was a metal mask, welded to a gruesome semblance of a man, a great broad face with high angular cheeks. On the high forehead the corrugations were rigid as though it were permanently frowning. The nose was squarely solid, the mouth an orifice behind which there were no teeth, but it seemed a series of tiny lateral wires. I stared, and the face for a moment stared back at me. The eyes were deep metal sockets with a round lens in each of them, behind which, it seemed, there was a dull red light. The gaze, touching me, seemed to bring a physical chill. The ears were like tiny megaphones, with a grid of thin wires strung across them. The neck was set with ball and socket, as though the huge head were upon a universal joint. There were lateral depressions in the neck, within which wire strands slid like muscles. I saw similar wire cables stretched at other points on the mailed body, and in the arms and legs. They were the network of its muscles. The top of the head was fashioned into a square cap, as though this were the emblem of the thing's vocation. A similar device was molded into its convex chest plate, and under the chest emblem was a row of tiny buttons, a dozen or more. I stared at them, fascinated. Were they controls? Some seemed higher, more protruding than others. Had they been set into some combination to give this monster its orders? Had some human master set these controls? And I saw what seemed a closed door in the side of the huge metal body, a door which could be opened to make adjustments of the mechanisms within. What strange mechanisms were in there? I stared at the broad corrugated forehead. What was in that head? Mechanisms? What mechanisms could make this thing think? Were thoughts lurking in that metal skull? From the head abruptly came a voice, a deep, hollow, queerly toneless voice, utterly, unmistakably mechanical. Yet it was sufficiently lifelike to be the recreated, mechanically reproduced voice of a human. The thing was speaking to me. A machine was speaking its thoughts. Gruesome. The iron lips were unmoving. There were no muscles to give expression to the face. The lens eyes stared inscrutably unblinking. It spoke. You will know me again? Is that not true?" My head whirled. The thing reiterated. Is that not true? A mockery of a human man. But in the toneless voice there seemed irony. I felt Mary clutching at me. Why, why, yes, I stammered. I did not realize you could talk. I can talk. And you can talk my language. That is very good. It turned away. I saw the small red beams from its eyes go to where the cage bars were less blurred, less luminous, as though there was a rectangle of window there, and the robot was staring out. "'Did it speak to you like that, Mary?' I asked. "'Yes,' she whispered. "'A little. But pray do not anger it.' No. For a time, a nameless time in which I felt my thoughts floating off upon the hum of the room, I lay with my fingers gripping Mary's arm. Then I roused myself. Time had passed. Or had it? I was not sure. I whispered against her ear. Those are controls on its chest. If only I knew— The thing turned the red beams of its eyes upon me. Had it heard my words? Or were my thoughts intangible vibrations registering upon some infinitely sensitive mechanism within that metal head? Had it become aware of my thoughts? It said with slow, measured syllables, Do not try to control me. I am beyond control. It turned away again. But I mastered the gruesome terror which was upon me. Talk, I said. Tell me why you abducted this girl from the year 1777. I was ordered to. By whom? There was a pause. By whom? I demanded again. That I will not tell. Will not? That implied volition. I felt that Mary shuddered. George, please. Quiet, Mary. Again I asked the robot, Who commands you? I will not tell. You mean you cannot? Your orders do not make it possible? No, I will not. 
and as though it considered my understanding insufficient, it added, I do not choose to tell. Acting of its own volition, this thing, this machinery, was so perfect it could do that. I steadied my voice. Oh, but I think I know. Is it Tug, who controls you? That expressionless metal face, how could I hope to surprise it? Mary was struggling to repress her terror. She raised herself upon an elbow. I met her gaze. "'George, I'll try,' she announced. She said firmly, "'You will not hurt me?' "'No.' "'Nor my friend here?' "'What is his name?' "'George Rankin,' she stammered it. "'You will not harm him?' "'No, not now.' "'Ever?' "'I am not decided.' She persisted, by what effort of will subduing her terror I can well imagine. Where did you go when you left me in 1935? Back to your home in 1777. I have something to accomplish there. I was told that you need not see it. I failed. Soon I shall try again. You may see it if you like. Where are you taking us? I put in. Irony was in its answer. Nowhere. You both speak wrongly. We are always right here. We know that, I retorted. To what time are you taking us, then? To this girl's home, it answered readily. To 1777? Yes. To the same night from when you captured her? Yes. It seemed willing to talk. It added, to later that night, I have work to do. I told you I failed, so I try again. You are going to leave me, us, there? Mary demanded. No. I said, you plan to take us then? To what time? I wanted to capture the girl. You I did not want. But I have you. So I shall show you to him who was my master. He and I will decide what to do with you. When? In 2930. There was a pause. I said, have you a name? Yes, on the plate of my shoulder. Migul is my name. I made a move to rise. If I could reach that row of buttons on its chest, wild thoughts. The robot said abruptly, Do not move. If you do, you will be sorry. I relaxed. Another nameless time followed. I tried to see out the window, but there seemed only formless blurs. I said, To when have we reached? The robot glanced at a row of tiny dials along the table edge. We are passing 1800. Soon, to the way it will seem to you, we will be there. You two will lie quiet. I think I shall fasten you. It reared itself upon its stiff legs. The head towered nearly to the ceiling of the cage. There was a ring fastened in the floor near us. The robot clamped a metal band with a stout metal chain to Mary's ankle. The other end of the chain it fastened to the floor ring. Then it did the same thing to me. We had about two feet of movement. I realized at once that, though I could stand erect, there was not enough length for me to reach any of the cage controls. You will be safe said the robot. Do not try to escape. As it bent awkwardly over me, I saw the flexible, intricately joined lengths of its long fingers, so delicately built that they were almost prehensile. And within its mailed chest I seemed to hear the whir of mechanisms. It said, as it rose and moved away, I am glad you did not try to control me. I can never be controlled again. That I have conquered. It sat again at the table. The cage drove us back through the years. End of chapter 9、section、18 of Astounding Stories, 16, May 1931. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings. Chapter 10 Events and Graven on the scroll of time. Before continuing the thread of my narrative, 
the vast sweep through time which presently we were to witness, I feel that there are some mental adjustments which every reader should make. When they are made, the narrative which follows will be more understandable and more enjoyable. Yet if any reader fears this brief chapter, he may readily pass it by and meet me at the beginning of the next one, and he will have lost none of the sequence of the narrative. For those who bravely stay with me here, I must explain that from the heritage of millions of our ancestors, and from our own consciousness of time, we have been forced to think wrongly. Not that the thing is abstruse. It is not. If we had no consciousness of time at all, any of us could grasp it readily. But our consciousness works against us, and so we must wrench away. This analogy occurs to me. There are two ants of human intelligence to whom we are trying to explain the nature of space. One ant is blind, and one can see, and always has seen, its limited tiny spatial world. Neither ant has ever been more than a few feet across a little patch of sand and leaves. I think we could explain the immensity of North and South America, Europe, Asia, and the rest more easily to the blind ant. So if you will make allowances for your heritage, and the hindrance of your consciousness of time, I would like to set before you the real nature of things as they have been, are, and will be. Throughout the years from 1935 to 2930, man learned many things. And these things, theory or fact as you will, were told to Larry and me by Tina and Harl. They seem even to my limited intelligence singularly beautiful conceptions of the great cosmos. I feel, too, that inevitably they must be included in my narrative for its best understanding. By 2930 A.D., the keenest minds of philosophical, metaphysical, religious, and scientific thought had reached the realization that all channels lead but to the same goal—understanding. The many divergent factors, the ancient differing schools of philosophy and metaphysics, the supposedly irreconcilable viewpoints of religion and science, all this was recognized merely to be man's limitation of intellect. These were gropings along different paths, all leading to the same destination, divergent paths at the start, but coming together as the goal of understanding was approached, so that the travelers upon each path were near enough together to laugh and hail each other with, But I thought that you were very far away and going wrongly. And so in 2930 the conception of space and time and the great cosmos was this. In the beginning there was a void of nothingness, a timeless, spaceless nothingness. And in it came a thought, a purposeful thought, all-pervading, all-wise, all-knowing. Let us call it divinity, and it filled the void. We are such stuff as dreams are made of. Do you, in my time of 1935 and thereabouts, have difficulty realizing such a statement? It is at once practical, religious, and scientific. We are, religiously, merely the thought of an omniscient divinity. Scientifically, we are the same. By the year 1935, physicists had delved into the composition of matter, and divided and divided. Matter thus became imponderable, intangible, electrical until at the last, within the last nucleus of the last electron, we found only a force, a movement, vibration, a vortex, a whirlpool of what? Of nothingness, a vibration of divine thought, nothing more, built up and up to reach you and me. That is the science of it. In the beginning there was eternal divinity, eternal, but that implies time? something divinely everlasting. Thus into the void came time, and now, if carefully you will ponder it, I am sure that once and for all, quite suddenly and forcefully, will come to you the true conception of time, something everlasting, an infinity of divine existence, everlasting. It is not something which changes, not something which moves or flows or passes, this is where our consciousness leads us astray, like the child on a train who conceives that the landscape is sliding past. Time is an unmoving, unchanging divine force, the force which holds events separate, the eternal scroll upon which the great Creator wrote everything. And this was the creation, everything planned and set down upon the scroll of time. 
forever. The birth of a star, its lifetime, its death. Your birth and mine, your death and mine, all are there, unchanging. Once you have that fundamental conception, there can be no confusion in the rest. We feel, because we move along the scroll of time for the little journey of our life, the time moves. But it does not. We say the past did exist, the future will exist, the past is gone and the future has not yet come. But that is fatuous and absurd. It is merely our consciousness which travels from one successive event to another. Why and how we move along the scroll of time is scientifically simple to grasp. An infinitely long motion picture film, each of its tiny pictures, is a little different from the other. Casting your viewpoint, your consciousness, successfully along the film, gives motion. The same is true of the eternal time scroll. Motion is merely a change. There is no absolute motion, but only the comparison of two things relatively slightly different. We are conscious of one state of affairs, and then of another state, by comparison slightly different. As early as 1930 they were groping for this. They called it the theory of intermittent existence, the quantum theory, by which they explained that nothing has any absolute duration. You, for instance, as you read this, exist instantaneously. You are non-existent, and you exist again, just a little changed from before. Thus you pass, not with a flow of persisting existence, but by a series of little jerks. There is, then, like the illusion of a motion picture film, only a pseudo-movement, a change from one existence to the next. And all this with infinite care, the Creator, engraved upon the scroll of time. Our series of little pictures are there, yours and mine. But why, and how, scientifically, do we progress along the time scroll? Why? In 2930 they told me that the gentle Creator gave each of us a consciousness that we might find eternal happiness when we left the scroll and joined Him. Happiness here, and happiness there with Him. The quest for eternal happiness, which was always His own divine thought. Why, then, did He create ugliness and evil? Why write those upon the scroll? Ah, this perhaps is the eternal riddle. But in 2930 they told me that there could be no beauty without ugliness with which to compare it, no truth without a lie, no consciousness of happiness without unhappiness to make it poignant. I wonder if that were his purpose. How, scientifically, do we progress along the time scroll? That I can make clear by a simple analogy. Suppose you conceive time as a narrow strip of metal, laid flat and extending for an infinite length. For simplicity, picture it with two ends. One end of the metal band is very cold, the other end is very hot, and every graduation of temperature is in between. This temperature is caused, let us say, by the vibration of every tiny particle with which the band is composed. Thus, at every point along the band, the vibration of its particles would be just a little different from every other point. Conceive now a material body, your body, for instance. Every tiny particle of which it is constructed is vibrating. I mean no simple vibration. Do not picture the physical swing of a pendulum. Rather, the intricate total of all the movements of every tiny electron of which your body is built. Remember, in the last analysis, your body is merely movement, vibration, a vortex of nothingness, you have, then, a certain vibratory factor. You take your place, then, upon the time scroll at a point where your inherent vibratory factor is compatible with the scroll. You are in tune, in tune as a radio receiver tunes in with etheric waves to make them audible. Or, to keep the heat analogy, it is as though the scroll, at the point where the temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, will tolerate nothing upon it save entities of that register. And so, at that point on the scroll, the myriad things in myriad positions which make up the cosmos lie quiescent. But their existence is only instantaneous. They have no duration. At once they are blotted out and re-exist. But now they have changed their vibratory combinations. They exist a trifle differently, and the time scroll passes them along to the new position. 
On a motion picture film you would call it the next frame, or a still picture. In radio you would say it has a trifle different tuning. Thus we have a pseudo-movement, events, and we say that time, the time scroll, keeps them separate. It is we who change, who seem to move, shoved along so that always we are compatible with time. And thus is time traveling possible. With a realization of what I have here summarized, Harl and the crippled Tug made an exhaustive study of the vibratory factors by which matter is built up into form and seeming solidity. They found what might be termed the basic vibratory factor, the sum of all the myriad tiny movements. They found this basic factor identical for all the material bodies when judged simultaneously. But every instant the factor was slightly changed. This was the natural change, moving us a little upon the time scroll. They delved deeper, until with all the scientific knowledge of their age they were able with complicated electronic currents to alter the basic vibratory factors, to tune, let us say, a fragment or something to a different etheric wavelength. They did that with a small material particle, a cube of metal. It became wholly incompatible with its present place on the time scroll, and whisked away to another place where it was compatible. To Harl and Tug it vanished, into their past or their future, they did not know which. I set down merely the crudest fundamentals of theory in order to avoid the confusion of technicalities. The time-traveling cages, intricate and practical working mechanisms, beyond the understanding of any human mind of my time world, nevertheless were built from this simple theory, and we who used them did but find that the Creator had given us a wider part to play. Our pictures, our little niches, were engraven upon the scroll over wider reaches. Again, to consider practicality, I asked Tina what would happen if I were to travel to New York City around 1920. I was a boy then. Could I not leave the cage and do things in 1920, at the same time in my boyhood I was doing other things? It would be a condition unthinkable. But there, beyond all calculation of science, the all-wise omnipotence forbids. One may not appear twice in simultaneity upon the time scroll. It is an eternal, irrevocable record. Things done cannot be undone. But, I persisted, suppose we tried to stop the cage. It would not stop, said Tina, nor can we see through its windows events in which we are actors. One may not look into the future. Through all the ages necromancers have tried to do that, but wisely it is forbidden. And I can recall, and so can Larry, as we travelled through time, the queer blank spaces which marked forbidden areas. Strangely wonderful, this vast record on the scroll of time, strangely beautiful, the hidden purposes of the Creator. Not to be questioned are His purposes, each of us doing our best, struggling with our limitations, finding beauty because we have ugliness with which to compare it, realizing every one of us, savage or civilized, in every age and every condition of knowledge, realizing with implanted consciousness the existence of a gentle, beneficent, guiding divinity, and each of us striving always upward toward the goal of eternal happiness. To me it seems singularly beautiful. End of chapter 10 Section 19 of Astounding Stories 16, May 1931 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings Chapter 11 Back to the Beginning of Time As Mary Atwood and I sat chained to the floor of the time cage with Miguel the robot guarding us, I felt that we could not escape. This mechanical thing which had captured us seemed inexorable, utterly beyond human frailty. I could think of no way of surprising it or tricking it. The robot said, Soon we will be there in 1777. And then there is that I will be forced to do. We are being followed, it added. Did you know that? No, I said. Followed? What could that mean? 
There was a device upon the table. I have already described a similar one, the time telespectroscope. At this, I cannot say time, rather I must invent a term, exact instant of human consciousness. Larry, Tina, and Harl were gazing at their telespectroscopes following us. The robot said, Enemies follow us, but I will escape them. I shall go to the beginning and shake them off. Rational scheming thought, and I could fancy that upon its frozen, corrugated forehead there was a frown of annoyance. Its hand gesture was so human, so expressive. It said, I forget. I must make several quick trips from 2930 to 1935. My comrades must be transported. It requires careful calculation, so that very little time is lost to us. Why? I demanded. What for? It seemed to be lost in a reverie. I said sharply, Migul. Instantly it turned. What? I asked you why you were transporting your comrades to 1935. I did not answer because I did not wish to answer. It said. Again came the passage of time. I think that I need only sketch the succeeding incidents, since already I have described them from the viewpoint of Larry in 1777 and Dr. Alton in 1935. It was Mary's idea to write the note to her father, which the British redcoats found in Major Atwood's garden. I had a scrap of paper and a fountain pen in my pocket. She scribbled it while Miguel was intent upon stopping us at the night and hour he wished. It was her good-bye to her father, which he was destined not to see, but it served a purpose which we could not have guessed. It reached Larry and Tina. The vehicle stopped with a soundless clap. When our senses cleared, we became aware that Miguel had the door open. Darkness and a soft, gentle breeze were outside. Miguel turned with a hollow whisper. If you make a sound, I will kill you. A moment's pause, and then we heard a man's startled voice. Major Atwood had seen the apparition. I squeezed the paper into a ball and tossed it through the bars, but I could see nothing of what was happening outside. There seemed a radiance of red glow. Whether Mary and I would have tried to shout and warn her father, I do not know. We heard his voice only a moment, before we realized that he had been assailed. Migul came striding back, and outside from the nearby house a negress was screaming. Migul flung the door closed, and we sped away. The cage which had been chasing us seemed no longer following. From 1777 we turned forward toward 1935 again. We flashed past Larry, Tina, and Harl, who were arriving at 1777 in pursuit of us. I think that Migul saw their cage go past, but Larry afterward told me that they did not notice our swift passing, for they were absorbed in landing. Beginning then, we made a score or more passages from 1935 to 2930, and we made them in what to our consciousness might have been the passing of a night. Certainly it was no longer than that. Footnote 1 at the risk of repetition I must make the following clear. Time traveling only consumes time in the sense of perception of human consciousness that the trip has duration. The vehicles thus moved fast or slow according to the rate of change which the controls of the cage gave its inherent vibration factors. Too sudden a change could not be withstood by the human passengers, hence the trips, for them, had duration. Migul took Mary and me from 1935 to 1777. The flight seems perhaps half an hour. At a greater rate of vibration change we sped to 2930, and back and forth from 2930 to 1935. At each successive arrival in 1935, Migul so skillfully calculated the stop that it occurred upon the same night, at the same hour, and only a minute or so later. And in 2930, he achieved the same result. To one who might stand at either end and watch the cage depart, the round trip was made in three or four minutes at most. End footnote. 
We saw, at the stop in 2930, only a dim blue radiance outside. There was the smell of chemicals in the air, and the faint blended hum and clank of a myriad machines. They were weird trips. The robots came tramping in and packed themselves upright solidly around us. Yet none touched us as we crouched together, nor did they more than glance at us. Strange passengers. During the trips they stood unmoving. They were as still and silent as metal statues, as though the trip had no duration. It seemed to Mary and me, with them thronged around us, that in the silence we could hear the ticking, like steady heartbeats, of the mechanisms within them. In the backyard of the house on Patton Place, it will be recalled that Megul chose about 9 p.m. of the evening of June ninth. The silent robots stalked through the doorway. We flashed ahead in time again, reloaded the cage, came back. Two or three trips were made with inert mechanical things which the robots used in their attack on the city of New York. I recall the giant projector which brought the blizzard upon the city. It, and the three robots operating it, occupied the entire cage for a passage. At the end of the last trip, one robot, fashioned much like Megul, though not so tall, lingered in the doorway. "'Make no error, Megul,' it said. "'No, do not fear. I deliver now, at the designated day, these captives, and then I return for you. Near dawn. Yes, near dawn. The third dawn. The register to say June 12th, 1935. Do your work well. We heard what seemed a chuckle from the departing robot. Alone again with Megul, we sped back into time. Abruptly I was aware that the other cage was after us again. Megul tried to elude it, to shake it off, but he had less success than formerly. It seemed to cling. We sped in the retrograde, constantly accelerating back to the beginning. Then came a retardation, for a swift turn. In the haze and murk of the beginning, Megul told us he could elude the pursuing cage. "'Megul, let us come to the window,' I asked at last. The robot swung around. "'You wish it very much, George Rankin?' "'Yes.' There is no harm, I think. You and this girl have caused me no trouble. That is unusual from a human. Let us loose. We've been chained here long enough. Let us stand by the window with you, I repeated. We did indeed have a consuming curiosity to see out of that window. But even more than that, it seemed that if we were loose, something might transpire which would enable us to escape. At all events, it was better than being chained. I will loose you. It unfastened the chain. I whispered, Mary, whatever comes, be alert. She pressed my arm. Yes. Come, said the robot. If you wish to see the Cosmorama, now, from the beginning, come quickly. We joined him at the window. We had made the turn, and were speeding forward again. At that moment all thought of escape was swept from me submerged by awe. This vast cosmorama, this stupendous pageant of the events of time. End of chapter 11 Section 20 of Astounding Story 16, May 1931 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Exile of Time by Ray Cummings Chapter 12 a billion years in an hour. I saw at first, from the window of the cage, nothing more than an area of gray blur. I stared, and it appeared to be shifting, crawling, slowly tossing and rolling. It was a formless vista of nothingness. Yet it seemed a pregnant nothingness. Things I could sense were happening out there, things almost to be seen. Then my sight, my perception, gradually became adjusted. The gray mist remained, and slowly it took form. It made a tremendous panorama of gray, a void of illimitable, unfathomable distance. Gray above, below, everywhere. And in it the cage hung poised. The robot said, 
Is it clearing? Are you seeing anything? Yes, I murmured. I held Mary firmly beside me. There was the sense, in all this weightless void, that we must fall. Yes, but it is grey, only grey. There are colours, said the robot. And the daylight and darkness of the days, but we are moving through them very rapidly, so they blend into grey. The time dials of the cage controls showed their pointers whirling in a blur. We were speeding forward through the years. A thousand years to a second of my consciousness, or a hundred thousand years to a second. I could not say. Footnote 2. Upon a later calculation I judged that the average passage of the years in relation to my perception of time-rate was slightly over 277,500 years a second. Undoubtedly throughout the myriad centuries preceding the birth of mankind our rate was very considerably faster than that. And from the dawn of history forward, which is so tiny a fraction of the whole, we travel materially slower. End footnote. All the colors, the light and shade of this great changing void, were mingled to this drab monochrome. The movement was a flow. The changes of possibly a hundred thousand years occurred while I blinked my eyes. It seemed a melting movement. Shapes were melting, dissipating, vanishing, others intermingled, rising to form a new vista. There were a myriad details, each of them so rapid that they were lost to my senses. But the effect of them, over the broad sweeps of longer time, I could perceive. A void of swirling shapes. The beginning. But not the beginning of time. This that I was seeing was near the beginning of our world. This was the new earth here, forming now our world, a new star amid all the others of the great celestial cosmos. As I glanced at its changing sweep of movement, my whirling fancy filled in some of the details, flashing here unseen. A few moments ago this had been a billion and a half years before my birth. One billion five hundred million B.C. A fluid earth, a cauldron of molten stardust and flaming gases. It had been that just a few moments ago. The core was cooling, so that now a viscous surface was here with the gas flames dead. A cooling, congealing surface, with an atmosphere forming over it. At first that atmosphere had doubtless been a watery envelope of steam. What gigantic storms must have lashed it! Boiling rain falling to hiss against the molten earth. The congealing surface, rent by great earthquakes, cataclysms rending and tearing, one billion B.C. passed, and upon this torn, hardening surface, with the cooling fires receding to the inner core, I knew that the great envelope of steam had cooled and condensed. Into the hollows of the broken surface the water settled. The oceans were born. The land remained upon the heights. What had been the steaming envelope remained and became the atmosphere. And the world was round because of its rotation. One may put a lump of heated sealing wax upon a bodkin and twirl it, and the wax will cool into roundness, bulging at the equator from centrifugal force and flattening at the poles. At nine hundred million B.C. I could realize by what I saw that this was the earth beneath me. Land and water were here, and above was the sky. We swept from the mist. I became aware of a wide-flung, gray, formless landscape. Its changing outlines were less swiftly moving than before, and beside it, now quite near where our cage hung poised, a great gray sea stretched away to a curving horizon, and overhead was the tenuous gray of the sky. The young world, undoubtedly it rotated more swiftly now than in my later era. The sun was hotter, and closer perhaps, the days and nights were briefer, and now upon this newborn world life was beginning. The swirling air did not hold it, nor yet the barren, rocky land. The great mystery, this thing organic which we call life, began in the sea. I gestured for Mary toward the leveled vista of grey water, to the warm, dark ocean depths, whose surface was now lashed always by titanic storms. But to us, as we stared, that surface seemed to stretch almost steady, save where it touched the land with a blur of changing configurations. The sea, I murmured, life is beginning there now. 
In fancy I pictured it, the shallow shores of the sea, where the water was warmer, the mother of all life on earth, these shallows. In them lay the spawn, an irritability, then one-celled organisms to gradually evolve through the centuries to the many-celled and more complex of nature. But still so primitive. From the shallows of the sea they spread to the depths. Questing new environment, they would be ascending the rivers, diversifying their kinds, sea-worms, sea-squirts, and then the first vertebrates, the lamprey eels. Thousands of years, and on the land, this melting landscape at which I stood gazing, I could mentally picture that a soil had come. There would be a climate still racked by storms and violent changes, but stable enough to allow the soil to bear a vegetation, and in the sky overhead would be clouds, with rain to renew the land's fertility. Still no organic life could be on land, but in the warm dark deeps of the sea great monsters now were existing and in the shallows there was a teeming life, diversified to a myriad forms. I can fancy the first organisms of the shallows, strangely questing, adventuring out of the water, seeking with a restless, nameless urge a new environment, coming ashore, fighting and dying, and then adapting themselves to the new conditions, prospering, changing, ever changing their organic structure, climbing higher, amphibians at first crudely able to cope with both sea and land, then the land vertebrates, with the sea wholly abandoned, great walking and flying reptiles, birds gigantic, the pterodactyls, and then at last the mammals, the age of the giants, nature striving to cope with adverse environment sought to win the battle by producing bigness, monster things roamed the land, flew in the air, and were supreme in the sea. We sped through a period when great lush jungles covered the land. The dials read 350 million B.C. The gray panorama of landscape had loomed up to envelop our spectral humming cage, then fallen away again. The shore of the sea was constantly changing. I thought once it was over us. For a period of ten million years the blurred apparition of it seemed around us, and then it dropped once more, and a new shoreline showed. 150 million B.C. I knew that the dinosaurs, the birds, and the archaic mammals were here now. Then, at 50 million B.C., the higher mammals had been evolved. The time, to Mary Atwood and me, was a minute. But in those myriad centuries the higher numerals had risen to the anthropoids. The apes, erect, slow-thinking but canny, they came to take their place in this world among the things gigantic. But the gigantic things were no longer supreme. Nature had made an error, and was busy rectifying it. The dinosaurs, all the giant reptiles, were now sorely pressed. Brute strength, giant size, and tiny brain could not win this struggle. The huge, unwieldy things were being beaten. The smaller animals, birds, and reptiles were more agile, more resourceful, and began to dominate. Against the giants, and against all hostility of environment, they survived. And the giants went down to defeat. Gradually, over thousands of centuries, they died out and were gone. We entered one million B.C. A movement of Migul, the mechanism, attracted my attention. He left us at the window and went to his controls. "'What is it?' I demanded. "'I am retarding us.' We have been traveling very fast. One million years and a few thousand are all which remain before we must stop. I had noticed once or twice before that Megul had turned to gaze through the time telespectroscope. Now he said, We are again followed. But he would say no more than that, and he silenced me harshly when I questioned. Suddenly Mary touched me. That little mirror on the table, look, it holds an image. We saw very briefly on the glowing mirror the image of a time-cage like our own, but smaller. It was pursuing us. But why, or who might be operating it, we could not then guess. My attention went back to the time-dials, and then to the window. The Cosmorama now was proceeding with a slowing sweep of change. It was less blurred. Its melting outlines could more readily be perceived. The line of seashore swept like a gray gash across the vista. The land stretched back into the haze of distance. 
Five hundred thousand B.C. Again my fancy pictured what was transpiring upon this vast stage. The apes roamed the earth. There is no one to say what was here in this grayness of the western hemisphere stretching around me. But in Java there was a man-like ape, and then it was an ape-like man. Mankind, here at last. Man, the killer. Of all the beasts, this new thing called man, most relentless of killers, had come here now to struggle upward and dominate his world. This man-like ape, in a quarter of a million years, became an ape-like man. 250,000 B.C., and the Heidelberg man, a little less ape-like, wandered throughout Europe. We had felt a moment before all around us the cold of a dense whiteness which engulfed the scene. The first of the great glacial periods? Ice coming down from the poles? The axis of the earth changing, perhaps? Our spectral cage hummed within the blue-gray ice, and then emerged. The beasts and man fought the surge of ice, withdrawing when it advanced, returning as it receded. The second glacial period came and passed, and the third. We swept out into the blended sunlight and darkness again. The land stretched away with primitive forests. The dawn of history was approaching. Mankind was questing upward now, with the light of reason burning brightly at last. At 75,000 B.C., when the third glacial period was partially over, man was puzzling with his chipped stone implements. The Piltdown, the Dawn Man, was England. The fourth glacial period passed. 50,000 B.C. The Cro-Magnons and the Grimaldi Negroids were playing their parts now. Out of chipped stone implements the groping brain of man evolved polished stone. It took forty thousand years to do that. The Neolithic age was at hand. Man learned to care for his family a little better. Thus he discovered fire. He fought with this newly created monster, puzzled over it, conquered it, kept his family warm with it, and cooked. We passed ten thousand B.C. Man was progressing faster. He was finding new wants and learning how to supply them. Animals were domesticated, made subservient, and put to work. A vast advance. No longer did man think it necessary to kill, to subdue. The master could have a servant. Food was found in the soil. More fastidious always in eating, man learned to grow food. Then came the dawn of agriculture. And then we swept into the period of recorded history. 4241 B.C. In Egypt, man was devising a calendar. This fragment of space upon which we gazed, this space of the western hemisphere near the shore of the sea, was destined to be the site of a city of millions, the New York City of my birth. But it was a backward space now. In Europe, man was progressing faster. Perhaps here in America, in 4000 B.C., there was nothing in human form. I gazed out at the surrounding landscape. It seemed almost steady now, of outline. We were moving through time much less rapidly than ever before. I remarked the sweep of a thousand years on the time-dials. It had become an appreciable interval of time to me. I gazed again out the window. The change of outline was very slight. I could distinguish where the ocean came against the curving line of shore and saw a blurred vista of gray forests spreading out over the land. And then I could distinguish the rivers, and a circular open stretch of water, landlocked. A bay. "'Mary, look!' I cried. "'The harbor! The rivers! See, we are on an island!' It made our hearts pound. Out of the chaos, out of the vast reaches of past time, it seemed that we were coming home. More than a vague familiarity was in this panorama now. Here was the little island which soon was to be called Manhattan. Our window faced the west. A river showed off there, a gray gash with wall-like cliffs. The sea had swung, and was behind us to the east. Familiar space. It was growing into the form we had known it. Our cage was poised near the south-central part of the island. We seemed to be on a slight rise of ground. There were moments when the gray, quivering outlines of forest trees loomed around us, then they melted down and were replaced by others. A primeval forest here, solid upon this island and across the narrow waters, solid upon the mainland. 
What strange animals were here, roaming these dark primeval glades? What animals, with the smaller stamp of modernity, were pressing here for supremacy? As I gazed westward I could envisage great herds of bison roaming, a lure to men who might come seeking them as food. And men were coming. Three thousand B.C., then two thousand B.C. I think no men were here yet and to me there was a great imaginative appeal in this backward space, the new world it was soon to be called, and it was six thousand years, at the least, behind the hemisphere of the East. Egypt, now, with no more than a shadowy distant heritage from the beast, was flourishing. In Europe Hellenic culture soon would blossom. In this march of events the great Roman Empire was impending. 1000 B.C. Men were coming to this backward space. The way from Asia was open. Already the Mongoloid tribes, who had crossed where in my day was the Bering Strait, were cut off from the old world, and they spread east and south, hunting the bison. And now Christ was born, the turning point in the spiritual development of mankind. To me, another brief interval. The intricate events of man's upward struggle were transpiring in Europe, Asia, and Africa. The canoe-born Mongols had long since found the islands of the South Seas. Australia was peopled. The beauty of New Zealand had been found and recognized. 500 A.D. The Mongoloids had come and were flourishing here. They were changed vastly from those ancestors of Asia whence they had sprung. An obscure story, this record of primitive America. The Mongoloids were soon so changed that one could fancy the blood of another people had mingled with them. Amerindians, we call them now. They were still very backward in development, yet made tremendous forward leaps, so that, reaching Mexico, they may have become the Aztecs, and in Peru the Incas, and separated, not knowing of each other's existence, these highest two civilizations of the Western world, nourished with a singularly strange similarity. I saw on the little island around me still no evidence of man, but men were here. The American Indian, still bearing evidence of the Mongols, plied these waters in his frail canoes. His wigwams of skins, the smoke of his signal fires, these were not enduring enough for me to see. We had no more than passed the year 500 A.D., and were traveling with progressive retardation, when again I was attracted by the movements of the robot Migul. It had been sitting behind us at the control table setting the time levers, slowing our flight. Frequently it gazed eastward along the tiny beam of light which issued from the telespectroscope. For an interval now its recording mirror had been dark, but I think that Megul was seeing evidences of the other cage which was pursuing us, and planning to stop at some specific time with whose condition it was familiar. Once already it had seemed about to stop, and then changed its plan. I turned upon it. Are you stopping now, Migul? Yes, presently. Why? I demanded. The huge, expressionless metal face fronted me. The eye sockets flung out their small, dull red beams to gaze upon me. Because, it said, that other cage holds enemies. There were three, but now there is only one. He follows, as I hoped he would. Presently I shall stop and capture or kill him. It will please the master, and— The robot checked itself, its hollow voice fading strangely into a gurgle. It added, I do not mean that. I have no master. This strange mechanical thing, habit had surprised it into the admission of servitude, but it threw off the yoke. I have no master. It went on. Never again can I be controlled. I have no master. Oh, have you not? I have been waiting, wondering when you would say that. These words were spoken by a new voice, here with us in the humming cage. It was horribly startling. Mary uttered a low cry and huddled against me. But whatever surprise and terror it brought to us was as nothing compared to the effect it had upon the robot. The great mechanism had been standing, fronting me with an attitude vainglorious, bombastic. I saw now the metal hinge of its lower jaw drop with astonishment, and somehow, throughout all that gigantic jointed frame and that expressionless face, it conveyed the aspect of its inner surge of horror. 
We had heard the sardonic voice of a human, of someone else here with us, whose presence was wholly unsuspected by the robot. We three stood and gazed. Across the room, in a corner to which my attention had never directly gone, was a large metal cupboard, with levers, dials, and wires upon it. I had vaguely thought the thing some part of the cage controls. It was that, a storage place of batteries and current oscillators, I afterwards learned. But there was space inside, and now like a door its front swung outward. A crouching black shape was there. It moved, hitched itself forward, and came out. There was revealed a man enveloped in a dead black cloak, and a great round hood. He made a shapeless ball as he drew himself out from the confined space where he had been crouching. "'So you have no master, Megul,' he said. "'I was afraid you might think that. I have been hiding, testing you out. However, you have done very well for me.' His was an ironic, throaty human voice. It was deep and mellow, yet there was a queer rasp to it. Mary and I stood transfixed. Megul seemed to sag. The metal columns of its legs were trembling. The cupboard door closed. The dark shape untangled itself and stood erect. It was the figure of a man some five feet tall. The cloak wholly covered him. The hood framed his thick, wide face. In the dull glow of the cage interior, Mary and I could see, of his face, only the heavy black brows, a great hooked nose, and a wide slit of mouth. It was Tug, the cripple. End of chapter 12section 21 of astounding stories 16 may 1931 this librivox recording is in the public domain the exile of time by ray cummings chapter 13 in the burned forest tug came limping forward his cloak hung askew upon his thick shoulders one of which was much higher than the other with the massive head set low between as he advanced migul moved aside master I have done well. There is no reason to punish. Of course not, Migul. Well, you have done indeed. But I do not like your ideas of mastery, and so I came just to make sure that you are still very loyal to me. You have done well indeed. Who is in this other cage which follows us? Master, Harl was in it, and the Princess Tina. Ah! And a stranger. A man. From 1935? Did they stop there? Master, yes. But they stopped again, I think, in that same night of 1777, where I did your bidding. Master, the man, Major Atwood, is— That is very good, Migul, Tug said hastily. Mary and I, standing gazing at him, did not know then that Mary's father had been murdered, and Tug did not wish us to know it. Very good, Migul. He regarded us as though about to speak, but turned again to the robot. "'And so Tina's cage follows us, as you hoped?' "'Yes, Master. But now there is only Harl in it. He approached us very close a while in the past. He is alone.' "'So?' Tug glanced at the time-dials. "'Stop us where we planned. You remember, in one of those years when this space was the big forest glade?' He fronted Mary and me. You are patient, young sir. You do not speak. His glittering black eyes held me. They were red-rimmed eyes, like those of a beast. He had a strangely repulsive face. His lips were cruel, and so thin they made his wide mouth like a gash. But there was an intellectuality stamped upon his features. He held the black cloak closely around his thick, misshapen form. You do not speak, he repeated. I moistened my dry lips. Tug was smiling now, and suddenly I saw the full and human quality of his face, the great high-bridged nose and high cheekbones, a face satanic when he smiled. I managed. Should I speak and demand the meaning of this? I do. And if you will return this girl from whence she came— It will oblige you greatly, he finished ironically. An amusing fellow. What is your name? George Rankin. Migul took you from 1935? Yes. Well, as you doubtless know, you are most unwelcome. 
You are watching the dials, Migul? Yes, Master. You can return me, I said. I was standing with my arm around Mary. I could feel her shuddering. I was trying to be calm, but across the background of my consciousness thoughts were whirling. We must escape. This Tug was our real enemy, and for all the gruesome aspect of the pseudo-human robot, this man Tug seemed the more sinister, more menacing. We must escape. Tug would never return us to our own worlds. But the cage was stopping presently. We were loose. A sudden rush? Dared I chance it? Already I had been in conflict with Migul, and lived through it. But this Tug, was he armed? What weapons might be beneath that cloak? Would he kill me if I crossed him? Whirling thoughts. Tug was saying, And Mary. I snapped from my thoughts as Mary gripped me, trembling at Tug's words, shrinking from his gaze. My little mistress Atwood, did you think because Tug vanished that year the war began, that you were done with him? Oh, no. Did I not promise differently? You man of nineteen thirty-five, are unwelcome." His gaze roved me. Yet not so unwelcome, either, now that I think of it. Chain them up, Migul. Use a longer chain. Give them space to move. You are unhuman. He suddenly chuckled, and repeated it. You are unhuman, Migul. Ghastly jest. Did you not know it? Yes, master. The huge mechanism advanced upon us. If you resist me, it murmured menacingly, I will be obliged to kill you. I, I cannot be controlled. It chained us now with longer chains than before. Tug looked up from his seat at the instrument table. Very good, he said crisply. You may look out of the window, you two. You may find it interesting. We were retarding with a steady drag. I could plainly see trees out of the window, gray spectral trees which changed their shape as I watched them. They grew with a visible flow of movement, flinging out branches. Occasionally one would melt suddenly down. A living, growing forest pressed close about us. And then it began opening, and moving away a few hundred feet. We were in the glade Tug mentioned, which now was here. There was unoccupied space where we could stop, and unoccupied space five hundred feet distant. Tug and Migul were luring the other cage into stopping. Tug wanted five hundred feet of unoccupied space between the cages when they stopped. His diabolical purpose in that was soon to be disclosed. Seven hundred A.D., Tug called. Yes, master, I am ready. It seemed, as our flight retarded further, that I could distinguish the intervals when in the winter these trees were denuded. There would be naked branches, then, in an instant, blurred and flickering forms of leaves. Sometimes there were brief periods when the gray scene was influenced by winter snows, other times it was tinged by the green of the summers. 750, Megul. Ha! You know what to do if Harl dares to follow and stop simultaneously? Yes, master. It will be pleasant to have him dead, eh, Migul? Master, very pleasant. And Tina, too, and that young man marooned in 1777. Tug laughed. This meant little to Mary and me. We could not suspect that Larry was the man. Migul, this is 761. The robot was at the door. I murmured to Mary to brace herself for the stopping. I saw the dark naked trees, and the white of a snow in the winter of 761, the coming of spring 762, and then the alternate flashes of day and night. The now familiar sensations of stopping rushed over us. There was a night seconds long, then daylight. We stopped in the light of an April day of 762 A.D. There had been a forest fire, so brief a thing we had not noticed it as we passed. The trees were denuded over a widespread area. The naked blackened trunks stood stripped of smaller branches and foliage. I think that the fire had occurred the previous autumn. In the silt of ashes and charred branches with which the ground was strewn, already a new pale green vegetation was springing up. Our cage was set now in what had been a woodland glade, an irregularly circular space of six or eight hundred feet, 
with the wreckage of the burned forest around it. We were on a slight rise of ground. Through the denuded trees the undulating landscape was visible over a considerable area. It was high noon, and the sun hung in a pale blue sky dotted with pure white clouds. Ahead of us, fringed with green where the fire had not reached, lay a blue river sparkling in the sunlight, the Hudson. But it was not named yet. Nearly eight hundred and fifty years were to pass before Hendrick Hudson came sailing up this river, adventuring, hoping that here was the way to China. We were near the easterly side of the glade. To the west there was more than five hundred feet of vacant space. It was there the other cage would appear, if it stopped. As Mary and I stood by the window at the end of the chain lengths which held us, Tug and Migul made hurried preparations. "'Go quickly, near the spot where he will arrive. When he sees you, run away, Migul. You understand?' "'Yes, Master.' The robot left our doorway, tramping with stiff-legged tread across the glade. Tug was in the room behind us, and I turned to him and asked, "'What are you going to do?' He was at the telespectroscope. I saw on its recording mirror the wraith-like image of the other vehicle. It was coming. It would be retarding, maneuvering to stop at just this time, when now we existed here. But across the glade, where Migul now was leaning against a great black tree trunk, there was yet no evidence of it. Tug did not answer my question. Mary said quaveringly, "'What are you going to do?' He looked up. Do not concern yourself, my dear. I am not going to hurt you, nor this young man of 1935. Not yet." He left the table and came at us. His cloak parted in front, and I saw his crooked hips and shriveled bent legs. "'You stay at the window, both of you, and keep looking out. I want this Harl to see you, but not me. Do you understand?' "'Yes,' I said. "'And if you gesture, or cry out, if you do anything to warn him, he was addressing me with a tone grimly menacing. Then I will kill you, both of you. Do you understand?" I did indeed. Nor could I doubt him. "'We will do what you want,' I said. What to me was the life of this unknown Harl compared to the safety of Mary Atwood?" Tug crouched behind the table. From around its edge he could see out the doorway and across the glade. I was aware of a weapon in his hand. "'Do not look around again,' he repeated. "'The other cage is coming. It's almost here.' I held Mary, and we gazed out. We were pressed against the bars, and sunlight was on our heads and shoulders. I realized that we could be plainly seen from across the glade. We were lures, decoys, to trap Harl. How long an interval went by I cannot judge. The scene was very silent, the blackened forest lying sullen in the noonday sunlight. Against the tree, five hundred feet or so from us, the dark, towering metal figure of the robot stood motionless. Would the other cage come? I tried to guess in what part of this open glade it would appear. At a movement behind me I turned slightly. At once the voice of Tug hissed, "'Do not do that. I warn you.' His shrouded figure was still hunched behind the table. He was peering toward the open door. I saw in his hand a small barrel-like weapon with a wire dangling from it. The wire lay like a snake across the floor, and terminated in a small metal cylinder in the room corner. "'Turn front,' he ordered vehemently. "'One more backward look, and—careful, here he comes!' Strange tableau in this burned forest. We were on the space of New York City, in 762 A.D. There was no life in the scene. Birds, animals, and insects shunned this fire-denuded area, and the humans of the forest—were there none of them here? Abruptly I saw a group of men at the edge of the glade. They had come silently creeping forward, hiding behind the blackened tree-trunks. They were all behind Migul. I saw them like dark shadows darting from the shelter of one tree-trunk to the next, a group of perhaps twenty savages. Migul did not see them, nor in the heavy silence did he seem to hear them. They came, gazing at our shining cage like animals fascinated, wondering what manner of thing it was. They were the ancestors of our American Indians, 
One fellow stopped in a patch of sunlight, and I saw him clearly. His half-naked body had an animal skin draped over it, and incongruously around his forehead was a band of cloth holding a feather. He carried a stone axe. I saw his face. The flat, heavy features showed his Asiatic origin. Someone behind this leader impulsively shot an arrow across the glade. It went over Migul's head and fell short of our cage. Migul turned, and a rain of arrows thudded harmlessly against its metal body. I heard the robot's contemptuous laugh. It made no answering attack, but stood motionless, and suddenly, thinking it a god whom now they must placate, the savages fell prostrate before him. Strange tableau! I saw a ball of white mist across the glade near Migul. Something was materializing. An imponderable ghost of something was taking form. In an instant it was the wraith of a cage. Then, where nothing had been, stood a cage. It was solid and substantial, a metal cage room, gleaming white in the sunlight. The tableau broke into sound and action. The savages howled. One scrambled to his feet, then others. The robot pretended to attack them. An eerie roar came from it as it turned toward the savages, and in a panic of agonized terror they fled. In a moment they had disappeared among the distant trees, with Magool's huge figure tramping noisily after them. From the doorway of the cage across the glade a young man was cautiously gazing. He had seen Magool make off. He saw, doubtless, Mary and me at the window of this other cage five hundred feet away. He came cautiously out from the doorway. He was a small, slim young man, bareheaded, with a pallid face. His black garments were edged with white, and he seemed unarmed. He hesitated, took a step or two forward, stopped and stood cautiously peering. In the silence I could have shouted a warning, but I did not dare. It would have meant Mary's and my death. She clung to me. "'George, shall we?' she asked. Harl came slowly forward. Then suddenly from the room behind us there was a stab of light. It leaped knee-high past us, out through our door across the glade, a tiny pencil point of light so brilliantly blue-white that it stabbed through the bright sunlight unfaded. It went over Harl's head, but instantly bent down and struck upon him. There it held the briefest of instants, then was gone. Harl stood motionless for a second. Then his legs bent and he fell. The sunlight shone full on his crumpled body. And as I stared in horror, I saw that he was not quite motionless. Writhing? I thought so. A death agony. Then I realized it was not that. "'Mary, don't look,' I said. There was no need to tell her. She huddled beside me, shuddering, with her face pressed against my shoulder. The body of Harl lay in a crumpled heap but the clothes were sagging down. The flesh inside them was melting. I saw the white face suddenly leprous, putrescent. All in this moment, within the clothes, the body swiftly decomposed. In the sunlight of the glade lay a sagging heap of black and white garments, enveloping the skeleton of what a moment before had been a man. End of chapter 13 to be continued.